right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Greg Stone from the Mount Sinai Heart Health System, and welcome to this uh, symposium on the COSERA II trial, Learn How the Coronary Sinus Reducer is a Potential Option for Patients with Refractory Angina. That's the official title, but I'll give you a little bit of the background for just a couple minutes. And uh, as somebody who's been spent the better part of the last four decades trying to optimize the outcomes of PCI, and fighting, frankly, a lot of wars against the cardiac surgeons, trying to establish the value of PCI, I think now I can kind of step back and see where revascularization sits um, in the world's ecostructure of taking patients with ischemic heart disease. And if you're really, really honest, while we do a very, very good job either recanalizing coronaries with PCI or bypassing them with surgery, um, we don't do a great job at treating angina. Uh, and what we've actually seen, and you're going to see some of this data, is that uh, even after non-complex PCI, 20 to 40 percent of patients develop recurrent angina. And we're learning more and more that it's not only about the epicardial coronary artery, but it's also about the microvasculature. Uh, then let's go beyond coronary artery disease and talk about patients who have innoca or unnoca, that is ischemia or angina with non-obstructive coronaries. And there is a whole burgeoning field where we're learning that these patients have, in most cases, abnormal microvasculature, in some cases, vasospasm. And this, is, this causes real ischemic chest pain. Uh, so the question is, if we can diagnose all of this and if we recognize that the problem exists, which is really the first part to getting to a solution, what do we do about it? And one of the uh, potential emerging therapies is the coronary sinus reducer. And I'm very, very excited about this. It's a, an interventional procedure you'll hear about. If those of you probably, mostly people in the audience probably know about it. But this is basically a bare metal stent-like device, which is implanted in the coronary sinus, increases back pressure, helps redistribute flow from the, um, from the uh, sub-epicardium um, uh, to the ischemic subendocardium, and seems to be quite effective in um, relieving residual um, uh, ischemic chest pain in patients with both obstructive coronary disease and perhaps also patients with ANOCA. And the COSERA-2 trial right now follows the COSERA-1 trial, which was approximately 100 patient sham controlled, blinded, um, randomized trial that was performed in Israel and Europe, published in the New England Journal, that showed the safety and effectiveness of the reducer. We're running now a pivotal randomized trial in the United States called COSERA-2 to help uh, 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 clear this for pre-market approval for use in patients with uh, end-stage refractory heart disease, class 3 or 4 and with no revascularization options despite three or four of the established antianginal drugs. And so we've got a, an incredible panel here of experts that are going to talk about a lot of these issues. Um, Alan Jeremias is going to speak about um, angina, the scope of the challenge, can expand a lot on uh, what I just talked about. Tim Henry, who has uh, made treating patients with refractory angina one of his real uh, career goals, is going to talk about identifying these patients and how you can expand your uh, practice to both um, uh, f find these patients and to uh, uh, provide effective therapy for them. Stefan Verhe, one of the original pioneers, is going to talk about the coronary sinus reducer. And Mega Prasad is going to speak about the future of clinical data um, uh, generation for the reducer. And then we're going to have some questions and discussion. And so I hope that everybody will participate in that discussion from the audience. So without any further ado, um, Alan, why don't you come up and tell us about the problem and the scope of angina. Thanks, Greg. And, uh Everybody uh, was here. Lunch is gone, but uh, hopefully we won't. Uh, we will keep you awake after you had uh, something delicious. So let's talk a little bit about angina. Um, we guys obviously know how it feels like, what the symptoms are, but you know I'm not sure that all of you guys realize the scope of of the problem. I certainly didn't before putting these slides together. It turns out that more than 100 million people worldwide are affected by this problem. Um, it obviously causes significant disability with, with, you know, disabling symptoms. Patients are on multiple medications, including obviously a lot of side effects from those. And then the hospital care for these patients is enormous with them having um, numerous um, admissions for this problem. And so it turns out that, you know, what we do with these patients when they come to the hospital is to do an angiogram. So we do over 2 million angiograms, both in the U.S. and in Europe. 
um, and about 1.2 million of those patients end up having either a PCI or a cabbage. But about 500,000, which is a quarter, I mean really a huge number, is estimated to have an OCA or angina with non-obstructive coronary disease. So that's also a whole field of patients where I think we don't have great therapies to offer at this point. And of course, this is a recurrent issue, even when those patients that have some form of treatment have um, frequent occurrences. Now, the good news is that the outcomes in terms of the heart, quote unquote, heart clinical endpoints of these patients is not so bad. The long-term mortality of patients with refractory angina, which obviously is the, the worst um, of, of this patient population, is relatively low, around 4% or less per year, and very comparable to those with patients um, having chronic um, ischemic heart disease. The major risk factors are advanced age, advanced angina class three or four, or LV dysfunction. So those are the patients you might have to kind of um, tailor therapy more aggressively towards. But for the rest, really the goal of therapy is symptom relief because you can't really improve much on their prognosis, which as mentioned, isn't, um, isn't so bad. And so before we talk about what we can do for these people, we have to kind of understand the, the different buckets, right? Who are these patients that we're talking about and what is causing the problem? And so this is kind of a large overview of, of what we're dealing with. Um, probably the most common are diffuse CAD or obstructive CAD that is not amenable to interventional therapy um, and microvascular disease. Those are, I think, the, the bigger um, uh, buckets, if you will. But there's, of course, you know, anomalous coronary origin. There is you know, LVH um, a mismatch between supply and demand. Um, so there's obviously also a bunch of other reasons. But I want to focus on the three most common ones, which are obstructive CAD with no good interventional options. Um, the large patient population actually has intervention and still has remaining chest pain. And then the ANOCA population. So this is one um, case in, in our group that we, a patient we have been following for a long, long time with recurrent instant restenosis of the LAD. Um, so this is 2010 already, he had restenosis, at which time he had um, rotational atherectomy of the entire um, stented segment with actually a reasonably good result. I'm not sure today this would be, you know, the first therapy we're, we're, we're using, but actually it looks okay in this case. But of course the problem is he comes back a, a few years later um, with the same issue, and at that point a second layer of stent is placed. Again, every time we do something, it looks okay, but then he comes back. So this is now four years later. Now he has recurrent instant restenosis. At that point, laser atherectomy is used, again, with a reasonably good result. And then he comes back a few years um, later after that and now has a CTO. And the CTO is recanalized, but of course, um, it came back with another occlusion. So this is just one example of a patient over a long time, almost 15 years, that has the same issue in a recurrent fashion. And again, we don't have great therapies for these patients. And this is not um, an exemption. Um, as you see, when you're looking at basically all the major interventional trials, it turns out that the recurrent angina rate is about between 20 and 30 percent in the PCI group. These are, this is not the patients that are assigned to medical therapy. These are PCI trials. So even with PCI, the recurrent angina rate is high. And I want to highlight the ABSORB trial. I think this is kind of an interesting trial um, because I guess of the premise that the, um, uh, the scaffold, the, the ABSORB stent, um, would improve vasomotion and potentially lead to better angina outcomes. And so it was very, very closely monitored. I mean, Greg obviously was the PI of the trial. He knows um, how this was done, but it was a very, very meticulous regimen. And so we have very good data on quality of life and recurrent angina. And as you see here, I don't want to look at the difference necessarily between Zions and Absorb because there was none, but the bottom line is that in 40% of cases at two years, um, angina recurred, um, again, despite a successful um, intervention. And this is not just limited to PCI. We have the same data for cabbage. Um, so in, in, in the major cabbage trials, the rate is about 25%, very, very similar. 
And we have done a study looking at successful PCI. These are, again, all PCIs where angiographics is successful. And what we asked the investigators to do is to do a blinded post-PCI IFR assessment to see what is the disease burden we're leaving behind despite us thinking we did a good job. And it turns out that in 24% of cases, there was still significant residual ischemia below the ischemic threshold um, despite us thinking uh, that we have fixed the problem. Most of those were focal lesions. This is one of those cases where this is a pre-angiogram, this is the post-angiogram. It's a reasonably good result um, in this LAD, but this is the, what the invasive data shows before the IFR was 0.39, so obviously very, very significantly impaired um, physiology in this LAD. Post-PCI, there was a um, significant improvement to 0.74, but still way below the ischemic threshold of 0.89. And what we found on the pullback was that there was one focal lesion um, with a huge gradient of 33 IFR units. And this is something that, if some, obviously, if this would have been detected during the case, we could have treated it. But this patient likely will return um, with, with angina. And so looking at our study overall, which was 500 patients, this looks at the IFR gain from before and after. So some patients had that started off at 0.2, 0.3, um, IFR and had substantial gain, you would think that those patients have significant improvement. But it turns out that's only about half the population. The other half of the population had very minor improvements or really no significant improvement at all. And some patients had actually worsening post-PCI physiology despite, again, successful, quote-unquote, successful angiographic PCI. And so that's a large patient population we're dealing with that we're not doing a great job in. And unfortunately, the angiogram doesn't tell us that. This is an assessment looking at the angiogram versus the post-PCI physiology assessment. And as you see here, there's really no good correlation between the angiogram um, and, um, and the physiology. Then, of course, we're dealing with diffuse disease. Sometimes we don't know it's diffuse disease because on the, on the angiogram, we find a focal lesion to put a stent in. And maybe that helps some, but as you see, we're leaving a lot of disease behind um, in this vessel that, again, likely will cause the patient to come back with recurrent chest pain. And in fact, what, what um, we found in this patient population is that those patients who have diffuse disease don't do well and actually have um, high rates of residual angina at about 50% compared to those patients who have a focal um, lesion who have lower rates, but still around 28% just like I mentioned before from the PCI trials. And then, as Greg mentioned in his intro, we have a whole bucket of patients with microvascular disease. And so this is the conceptual thinking or distribution of those patients where I would say in this quadrant here, we have both normal epicardial and normal um, microcirculation, which is close to 50% of the population. And then the other 50% is distributed um, in the other quadrants where um, it's predominantly macrovascular disease, meaning a low FFR, um, and a low um, IFR in this quadrant, which is 25%. Um, and then you have the other buckets as well. So obviously, these two things are coexistent in, in many patients. And the problem with that, despite um, uh, or the problem that, that we have in this patient population is that these patients are very, very symptomatic. They um, come frequently to the hospital. They consume a lot of um, healthcare resources. And as you see here, um, when you're looking at this patient population, you know, the, the more advanced CAD we're dealing with, including microvascular disease, the more um, healthcare cost um, we have in, in this population. So this is what, where we stand. Um, we know chronic stable angina is a very, very common medical condition. We know that the prognosis overall is good, except for a few patients who have high risk factors, but the quality of life is significantly impaired in this patient's population. The etiology is um, dependent, is, is different, although the major buckets, as mentioned, are patients that have quote-unquote successful PCI and still have chest pain after that, patients who um, don't have really good treatment options, and patients with microvascular disease. And there's no question that we need new treatment modalities um, for this difficult patient population. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Alan. That was a terrific overview. Okay, now Tim Henry, uh, uh, pleasure to have him come up here from Cincinnati, a long way across the country. He's going to tell us about finding patients and treating them with refractory angina. 
Thanks, Greg. I'm uh, delighted to be here, and it's great to have a great turnout, because I think we're, uh, it's safe to say we're very excited about the trial. And <clears throat> so Alan just laid the case that there's a lot of angina out there. And there probably is, just in the United States, 12 to 15 million patients have angina. But yet, refractory angina trials have been traditionally a little bit difficult to enroll. So why is that? Where, where does it come? Um, so first, let's talk a little bit and look pictures of where these patients are. So this is uh, a, sort of a classification that Mark Jalcourt and I put together. And if you look at it, there's four groups that we look at. The one on, on the upper left is microvascular angina. So traditionally, this hasn't really been thought of as refractory angina because it was thought to be obstructive coronary disease. But these are patients who have severe angina despite medical therapy, and they're certainly not candidates for revascularization, so they really fit the definition. In the upper right hand, you have this sort of group of um, patients, and it's interesting because I've been doing refractory angina for a long time. Used to be interventionalists said, We're, I don't ever see these patients. Then we developed CTO, PCI, and now they're everywhere, right? And I think an important part of when you do this is who you work with is we have a really good relationship with our CTO. Because this is, and I think a lot of the CTO community now realizes this is an important part of working together and finding good options for these patients. So that group of patients are the patients who have a limited territory at risk, one or two CTOs, and it really we've done a really good job with CTO PCI. The group on the lower left is a really challenging one, and that's the diffuse distal and side branch disease that's really difficult to treat, and that's sort of your type 1 diabetic, but you know, we now have al almost 40% of the population is it, it will be diabetic, so this is going to grow. And then on the bottom is the end-stage coronary disease. So, Last week in my clinic, I had six new refractory angina patients. One lady had had 57 caths, and the least was someone who'd had 18. So these are people who've had uh, multiple bypasses, multiple PCIs, and really it's at this point in time, there's really not much left you can do. So one of the challenges with refractory engine is the terminology's been difficult. People call it different things. So no option patients, refractory engine, refractory schema, non-revascularizable, advanced coronary disease. And really before, there was almost no natural history data. Because you can't get it, there's no large databases and you can't get data from registries about doing it. Or to get to it, you have to go a little diffusely, like three vessel disease or, you know, it, it's really difficult. And it's been said in the past that these patients had high morbidity and mortality. And so when we actually looked at that, they actually didn't. Now, when you look, so you have all these patients with angina. But what we're looking for is patients who have class three or class four angina. How many patients like that are out there despite no revascularization? If you look at it under cardiac catheterizations, turns out about 12 to 15 percent of people who get cathed have non-revascularizable disease. If you look at it at people who have the angina population, but both these pyramids when you get up, it turns out there's probably 25 to 60,000 patients in the United States who have no option refractory angina defined as class three or class four. Now, where do you see these patients? So what we've done is really, and I would argue for those of you who don't have a chest pain clinic, whatever you decide to call it, you should. Because there's a ton of people out there, and I will tell you, I just moved to Cincinnati four years ago. I'm overwhelmed with them. And it's not my, it's just not, it's not just me, it's our CTO guy and our woman's heart clinic. Like literally, it's impossible to get in almost. And so I would encourage you, every large cardiology group in the country should have a dedicated chest pain clinic. And you need to look at other places to look is coordinate with your CTO program, coordinate with EECP programs, some places call it advanced coronary disease program, and then with the women's heart program. So it's important, I think, to have a really good collaboration with all those groups. One of the issues about angina, I think that is important if you look at it, it's angina is symptom, but when you see these patients, you have one is symptoms, and it can be either angina or ischemic dyspnea. But then you have myocardial perfusion. And traditionally, this has been challenging because there isn't a really a great uh, test until more recently, it really, really looks like PET 
advanced PET scanning is really good at not only determining ischemia, but looking at coronary flow reserve. So I think for the first time, and I think one of really important parts of this study is the PET studies, a sub-study that we're going to hear more about in a minute. And then the third issue is coronary anatomy. So when you see these patients, you have, number one, you can have terrible diffuse disease, but your perfusion looks normal. Or you can have lots of angina and no things. So this is a mixture, and all the patients don't have all three. So it can be complicated taking care of them. So what we did is we recognized that this was a problem, and so we started off, we call it the Optimus program. This is at Minneapolis Heart. But I can tell you now, over the course of uh, 30 years, 25 years, we've done it three places. Minneapolis Heart, then at Cedars, and now at the, at the Linder Center at, in Christ Hospital. In all three places, we were able to rapidly grow very large clinics, because there's a huge unmet need. Huge unmet need. And our goal was when we did this to improve the quality of care for a unique and growing subset of patients, to define the long-term outcome, natural history, and predictors, and then to provide new treatment options, both what's available and what's not yet available. So why call it the Optimist Clinic, which is options uh, in myocardial ischemic syndromes? Well, would you rather send your mom four hours to go to the no option clinic? So we, we uh, decided to do that. You can call the clinic whatever you want, but the point is to have a advanced coronary disease chest pain clinic. And what we do when you, when you come to the clinic, so we, number one, make sure they're on optimal medical management. Number two, make sure that you do risk factor modification. So in this patient population, almost no one, there's a lot of former smokers, almost no one still smokes. LDLs are less than 70. They're always on the uh, you know, antiplatelet therapy. And, and then you review the revascularization options. So I always look at the last two or three angiograms and say, is there any place here where you could get progression of disease? So when someone comes to clinic, we do all of those. And then what we do is to, you need more than one treatment option. Because what we've shown is this is a chronic condition. People live a long time. So mortality is actually much lower, not much higher than with stable engine, and not much higher than age-matched controls. So the point about this is to have lots of options. And I don't think these options are com competing. I think that they work together and that you need multiple options for it. So mo many of these patients that we put in this trial have already had EECP. And of course, by definition, they're on optimal medical management. So, for when you summarize, when you look at these patient, a patient who comes to your clinic with chest pain, it's really important to remember that there's three components of this. And many of these patients have all three. So there's an aspect of microvascular, what's your microvascular function? Number two, there's vasospastic and vasoconstriction. And then number three, there's epicardial coronary disease. And this is a spectrum, it's like patients are not just in one bucket. And then the f last thing that I'll end now, and so have uh, plenty of time for discussion, is when you do this at your institution, this is a collaborative venture. So you work very closely with, um, you know, the pain, we, um, pain management specialists, with um, uh, heart failure doctors, with the CV surgeons, with the CTO person, with the Women's Heart Program. And you do a very collaborative approach, and so the patient has ongoing chest pain or ischemic dyspnea, we're able to find an option that makes their life better. And I will, last thing I'll say, why am I passionate about this? Is having taken care of these patients for a long time, when you really have class three or four angina, you're miserable. Your life is ruined. You know, you can walk two or three blocks, you can't take care of your activities of daily living. And so I think this is a really important trial to make a difference to a really uh, uh, important subset of uh, the angina population. Thanks, Greg. All right. <laughs> Terrific. Thanks, Tim, and thanks for staying on time. But uh, you know, your passion is is evident, and it's it's really true for people who see a lot of these patients. Uh, your heart goes out to them because we often, you know, to take them back to the cath lab every six or twelve months is not very pleasant, actually. Okay, so um, uh, Stefan Verhe, who's really one of the original pioneers in working with the reducer, um, is going to tell us all about this technology uh, and Casero One.
Thank you, Greg. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'd like to thank uh, Shockwave for um, having me here and, and presenting on, on behalf of everyone involved with the reducer. Those are my uh, conflicts. Um, so uh, this goes back a long time. This, uh, first of all, it was uh, the concept was introduced uh, in the in the 50s by by Dr. Beck, who did uh, open heart surgery. That was a time when cabbage was uh, non-existent, and so what he did was he put a, a suture on the coronary sinus. And it turned out that these patients at that time, uh, they improved in terms of angina. They had a reduced mortality and also a reduced infarct size. But then, of course, uh, kind of forgotten because of uh, the uh, coronary artery bypass surgery that uh, came along. And so this procedure was no longer performed. But um, a similar um, procedure was uh, performed, uh, and it's called uh, PIXO. So that was an intermittent uh, balloon occlusion of the coronary sinus, uh, which was introduced in uh, Vienna, Austria. And it was shown that it was, was able to uh, protect the myocardial uh, tissue and also reduce infarct size and improve coronary microvascular function. And it was until uh, the early 2000s when Neovasc uh, developed the uh, coronary sinus reducer, which is an hourglass-shaped device. It's a uh, stainless steel mesh. And the first study was, uh, was performed, uh, first patients, I believe, were done in India and then also in Germany. And it was shown that it was able to improve angina, improve ischemia, and improve coronary microvascular function. So my, talks, my task here is to talk uh, a little bit about the coronary sinus, about the design, about how the procedure is performed, and uh, touch upon a little bit about the mechanism as to why the reducer uh, is uh, functioning. So the, as I mentioned, it's an hourglass uh, device that is uh, basically, it's a, it's a stainless steel mesh that is mounted on an hourglass balloon with a proximal section maximum up to 13 millimeters and distal 11 millimeters. And it has a neck uh, of an, and a diameter of three millimeters with a length of uh, 22 millimeters. Okay, so the, the, uh, the reducer is, is, is positioned, it's a juggler axis, it's a ninth French uh, axis through the, uh, through the juggler vein. And you first try to engage the coronary sinus, and I, I don't know how the situation is in the US, but in Europe at least, interventional lists are not very familiar with uh, uh, the coronary sinus, and that's something that we have to, have to uh, teach and to introduce. Of course, the P doctors are familiar with it. Um, but we tried, it's, it's a new area, and so uh, we have to um, teach the, um, the physicians how to do this, the interventionalists, uh, when it comes to uh, implanting a reducer. So first you access the uh, uh, right atrium with a multipurpose catheter, and you try to engage the coronary sinus with a uh, 0.035 wire. Um, you in advance the, uh, the guiding um, and the reducer uh, on the delivery system, and then you uh, position it in the most proximal part of the coronary sinus. And then you withdraw the sheath and you inflate the, uh, the device with, uh, with the balloon. So typically you have a 10 to 20% oversizing of the implanted reducer. And then uh, you have to tell the patients that that is very critical. And we know that these patients are desperate and they're very much you know, looking forward to have some improvement in symptoms. But you have to mention that, the, that it may take uh, four to eight weeks before uh, initial symptoms start to uh, uh, improve. So, as I mentioned, the multipurpose is uh, positioned in the coronary sinus. You make an angiogram and you do also QCA, so to have a sort of an idea what the uh, uh, dimensions is of the, uh, of the coronary sinus. And then um, there's only one size available of this device, and so you need to make sure that um, you properly size. Then you advance the um, delivery system of the reducer and you see three markers. The reducer is uh, situated between the two distal markers and then there is a more proximal marker. And this proximal marker, I'll show you in a minute as why this is needed. Um, oops. This is, uh, okay, so you, um, I need to go back one more, apologize.
click off the slide to go back. I think. Click off the video. Yeah, I'm trying to correct, but right -click. Uh, it's not. It's not. Right click. Give you a preview. Go to the keyboard. Go to the back arrow on the keyboard. Okay. Um, you know, right click doesn't is not working. Sorry about that. Need to go back one more. Really want to show. This is. Um, okay. Okay, so um, this, is the, this is the final result. So once you have implanted the, the reducer, so basically you put the, uh, the reducer at the end of the guiding and you start to withdraw the, she the, uh, the sheath and then you um, basically uh, inflate the balloon. So you make sure that, as I mentioned, you overexpand the reducer so that you have a good apposition of the reducers into the uh, uh, coronary sinus. And then you make a final angiogram. And so a little bit about um, what, is, what is, people ask all the time, what is the mechanism? We, we know that there is an improvement in symptoms. Pe uh, people uh, do better uh, once they have uh, received a reducer. And what is the mechanism? And it was actually early on uh, introduced uh, um, in 2000, uh, published 2001 by IDO, where they did a, um, a study to where they were able that the uh, coronary sinus occlusion was enhancing the coron coronary collateral flow and reduce in, in the cardiac ischemia. So they ligated the uh, LAO, and when they uh, put a coronary sinus occluder, they actually were able to show that there is an improvement in, in blood flow. And that was uh, early on, uh, before any reducer was actually implanted into, uh, into humans. Uh, this was extensively studied um, by uh, Shmuel Banai, who did, who was obviously the one who started the whole um, reducer story. And this is uh, the results that were published. Uh, it's a preclinical safety study and feasibility study. They did a lot of mini swine, but they also did. Uh, they looked at safety, but they also looked at uh, efficacy and the DSE, and they were able to show that there was an improvement and a re recovery of perfusion in these swines. And they also were able to measure the pressure gradient across the uh, reducer. The histology was also favorable with tissue response and improvement is in ischemia and, ischemia and no mortality of the, uh, of the swine. And then very recently, this year, and we talked about ANOCA, but this study done by Tommaso Gori in, in uh, Germany actually uh, showed that in these patients, there was in, in, so patients with microvascular angina uh, with an IMR ab above 25, and it was not using a reducer, but it was a concept of the reducer by putting an undersized balloon in the coronary sinus and then deflating the balloon in the right atrium as a sham control, and then looking at measurements that were performed at rest and during maximal cor coronary hyperemia. And these patients were applied uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the randomization. What they were able to show is that there was uh, a reduction in, in the resting uh, resistance in patients who had a balloon versus uh, the sham control. And so the microvascular resistance index also improved the IMR in the balloon group was lower than the, uh, the ones in the sham group. So this, is, this gives you a sort of an idea that indeed it is all related to the blood flow and the um, improvement in perfusion. And that's exactly also what Ido had shown in the DOC model is that you have an, uh, a flow reversal. When you have ischemia, you have uh, less flow to the subendocardial tissue. And when you put the reducer in term, when, when there is also the presence of ischemia, you actually are able to reduce the, uh, the uh, to invert the flow. And so you have a epi to endo improvement of the flow in presence of the reducer. And that was also illustrated in this uh, study in Italy, where they evaluated 21 refractory angina patients with obstructive coronary artery disease and who underwent physiological assessments before and at four months. And you can see that the IMR baseline uh, at 33 went down to 16 at four months 
with an improvement of uh, coronary flow reserve. And as uh, also mentioned by, uh, by Dr. Henry, um, the PET scan is, is an incredible, um, valuable tool to assess the, uh, the mechanism and to improve the perfusion to show the benefits of the reducer. And this was done uh, in patients with refractory angina before implantation and 12 weeks after implantation where you have a better uh, perfusion uh, using PET. And also again illustrated in a study by uh, Renil da Silva in the context of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this is a very important tool to actually show that the device is doing something to the patient. And I just want to end here with two important um, uh, notes, is that the NeoVasc reducer, the shockwave reducer, was granted the breakthrough device designation from the FDA in 2018, and it was uh, also implemented in the uh, 2019 ESC guidelines um, that a reducer device for coronary sinus constriction may be considered to ameliorate symptoms um, of debilitating angina and refractory to optimal medical and revascularization strategy. So with that, thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you, Stefan. Okay, so now Meg Versailles is going to tell us about some of the current and future data generation for the coronary sinus reducer, and then we'll have a discussion. Thank you. So I have two main objectives here today. First, I want to review some key previous studies that have explored the role of the coronary sinus reducer in treating refractory angina. And second, I want to discuss the study design of COSERA 2, which all of us are here are very excited about, um, and hopefully encourage you to find ways to enroll your patients. So the coronary sinus reducer is something that we've been hearing a lot about recently, but in reality, over 2,800 CS reducer patients have been studying study dating back to 2007 from this initial study by Dr. Benai looking at 15 patients with severe angina and reversible ischemia. The study found that there was procedural success in all patients and the patients were followed for six months with follow-up dibutamine stress echoes and assessment of their angina and essentially noticed that in, in almost all patients there was improvement in angina and ischemia at six months. There's a variety of studies in between, but I want to highlight COSERA-1, which is uh, an important study to, to go through here today to set the stage for COSERA-2. COSERA was the first multicenter randomized double-blind sham controlled safety and efficacy trial that, if, that demonstrated safety and effectiveness of the CS reducer. Its design was taking 104 patients with refractory angina with CCS grade 3 or 4, maximally tolerated GDMT who had no revascularization options, and, re and basically randomized 52 to the reducer arm and 52 to a sham control arm. The primary endpoint that was assessed in this trial was the improvement of at least greater than two CCS angina classes at six months. And you can see the results of the study here. Um, and it achieved its endpoint in that there was significant improvement in greater than two CCS classes in the reducer arm versus the sham control arm with the p-value of 0 0.02. And this was coupled with low 30-day uh, serious adverse events. I want to take a second to just show visually the change in angina, and you can see the patient started with CCS 3-4, and by the end of the study at six months, the majority of them had moved to CCS 1 and 2, um, further uh, illustrating the results of that study. The Reducer 1 is, study is also important to mention. This is a multi-center, open-label, post-market observational study, and we only have interim results right now, but this is essentially confirming safety and improvement in symptoms, functional status, as well as quality of life in these patients with refractory angina. This study includes 180 patients that are being studied prospectively, as well as additional patients that are being studied retrospectively. And as we look at the patients, you can see that the mean age is about 68, 69 years old. The majority of patients are male. Many of them have had a previous myocardial infarction, and many have had previous cabbage, and this is you know, sort of the patient population that Dr. Henry has already um, showed us today. Uh, but as you look at the percentages of previous cabbage, previous PCI, hyperlipidemia, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension, you can see that these patients have high uh, baseline comorbidities. 
70% of patients had CCS uh, 3 to 4 uh, in, the, in the baseline studies here. And what you can see is that 17% had a reduction in, in their angina at six months. 70% improved greater than one CCS grade at six months. And the most interesting part of this has been the long-term follow-up. And what we can see here is that there's sustained CCS improvement out to 24 months. And that suggests durability of the results that we saw from COSERA-1. So moving to COSERA-2. COSERA-2 is a randomized prospective control, double-blind sham controlled trial. The PIs are sitting right here, Dr. Stone and Dr. Henry. And the study is randomizing 380 patients with CED and refractory angina with CCS grade 3 or 4, maximally tolerated medical therapy who have no revascularization options. The study will be randomizing 190 patients to the coronary sinus reducer arm and 190 patients to the sham control arm. And I'd like to draw your attention um, to this uh, down here. And so essentially at 30 days, 90 days, six months, one year, and at five years, CCS angina grade will be assessed. At six months and one year, exercise tolerance and angina diaries will be assessed. And then SAQ scores and quality of life scores will be assessed at six months, one year, and at five years. Let's look a little bit about the eligibility criteria and who is going to be included in these patients. So like Dr. Henry went over, this is going to be mostly patients with obstructive CAD with persistent refractory angina, CCS 3 to 4, despite maximally tolerated guideline-directed medical therapy of at least three drugs. Patients will have reversible myocardial ischemia and the left coronary artery circulation to be randomized. They're, um, they should be deemed to have no revascularization options by the interventionalist that's uh, presenting the case. Their uh, modified Bruce protocol, they would go about two to eight minutes, and they would have a normal ejection fraction greater than 30 percent. A key occlusion criteria is the study will not be randomizing patients who have ACS, patients with elevated right atrial pressures, or patients that have abnormal CS anatomy for obvious reasons. The primary effectiveness endpoint at six months is a change in total exercise duration on the modified Bruce protocol. And then the primary safety endpoint is the composite of death, MI, pericardial effusion, device embolization, or bleeding. Some key secondary effectiveness endpoints include change in angina grade, change in SAQ angina stability. At six months and 12 months, looking at exercise tolerance and exercise duration, as well as angina frequency. And then annually through five years, as I mentioned earlier, looking at improvement in greater than one or greater than two CCS angina grades, change in SAQ scores. And then perhaps most importantly, the number of unplanned office visits, hospitalizations, and ER visits for angina. The study will also be looking at the number of deaths, MIs, stroked, and unplanned revascularization procedures throughout follow-up. A really exciting part of the study is looking at, the, at these various sub-studies and registries, so I'm going to briefly highlight this. There'll be a CTA sub-study that will be 50 patients to assess device position, structure, and function at 12 months. The PET sub-study was briefly covered already, but this is essentially to assess transmural perfusion, subendocardial perfusion, and absolute coronary blood flow at six months, and this will be 120 subjects in this arm. And then there's various single-arm registries that will also generate some thought-provoking data. The first is 110 patients in the R with, who have RC predominant ischemia, patients with ANOCA, that, as was covered before, non-obstructive coronary disease, this will be 110 patients, and then patients that are unable to complete an exercise tolerance test due to lower limb amputations, and this will be up to 50 patients. We're excited to announce that there's 30 activated trial sites right now, um, and there's a process that we'll discuss during the discussion and how these sites are activated and then how the initial um, studies are, are conducted. I'm going to briefly just cover these additional CS reducer studies. So some of these were already covered earlier, but there's a variety of studies looking at various patient populations, ANOCA and CMD, a few studies looking at refractory angina and obstructive CAD, and then another study here, and this data will be presented um, looking at ANOCA and CMD. But essentially, there's a variety of patient populations that can be enrolled into these studies, but not all will be randomized in COSERA-2. Some key take-home points are first, several studies have shown efficacy of the coronary sinus reducer in reducing angina and ischemia in patients with no revascularization. Coursera 2 is a randomized double-blinded control trial designed to assess whether the sinus reducer improves exercise tolerance in patients with ischemia and no revascularization options. There are several smaller ongoing cohort studies and randomized studies to assess the role of the coronary sinus reducer in improving angina and exercise tolerance. 
and we really need to think about enrolling these patients in these trials as this is critical to advancing therapeutic options for our patients with refractory angina. Thank you. Well, terrific, Mega. We, we have 15 minutes, uh, so anyone who would like to ask a question, please come up to the mic. Uh, maybe I can start by asking everyone on the panel. I have a question for everybody. So, um, uh, you know, perhaps let me start with um, uh, Tim. So, so Tim, you've listed, uh, you know, when you've got a lot of these patients that you take care of with refractory angina, you've got different options for them. You try to optimize their medical therapies, et cetera. You consider revascularization, ECP, other investigational approaches. What proportion of the patients, and you've taken care of thousands of such patients over the years, what proportion of these patients do you think you can get down to class one or maybe class two angina with our current current therapies, the ones that you see? So that's a great question. We actually did this prospectively in our uh, angina clinic in Minneapolis. And we looked at all patients from the first day they were in the clinic until one year later. And 85% of the patients had improved by at least one class. So the point is, you know, what happens with these patients is uh, typically they have chest pain with or without a positive stress test and they go to the cath lab and the interventionist says, well, there's nothing we can do. And someone futzes with their beta blocker or their MDR, and then they go home and they go back to the internist and they, well, the, the internist doesn't send them to the cardiologist because the cardiologist said there's nothing you can do. And then what happens is patients have more angina, they get depressed, they lose their job, they can't work, and then they gain weight, and it's this downward spiral. And so I think if you see people and have options, you can actually change that around for sure. Great. So, a question? So, sorry, sorry. So, I have, I'm basically an interventionist, a cardiology interventionist. I'm doing CTOs. And most of my patients have uh, ischemia, CTO patients, I mean, have a reversible ischemia in the, in, the, in the stress testing. However, they have not angina, but they have dyspnea. And after the procedure, they improve a lot, the dyspnea. So, the question here is uh, why don't you? Uh, include patients with this equivalent of angina into the trial, and do you think that it makes sense to expand the indication of the reducer to that population? Thank you. Yes, maybe I can take that one. Uh, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a lot of people who have either atypical angina or anginal equivalent disease, which is often dyspnea on exertion. But we're not including them in the trial for basically trial-specific reasons. We wanted a, quote, harder endpoint where we can show an objective reduction in angina. And as you know, dyspnea can be due to COPD, it can be due to deconditioning, it can be due to general fatigue and, and other types of issues. So it's a little bit harder to reproducibly measure. But there's no reason to think that if the um, reducer uh, is, is effective in ischemic heart disease patients whose manifestation is angina, that it wouldn't be equally as effective in patients whose manifestation of the ischemia is dyspnea. And dyspnea is not excluded in the trial, but you also have to have anginal chest pain. Right. You can have dyspnea on exertion, but the principal manifestation has to be right. uh, uh, angina. Thanks. Any other questions? Please come up to the mic. We'd love to hear from you. Great. Hi. Congratulations on well-designed study. I'm curious about um, the fact in the earlier study you had about 20% women and 80% men. And I'm wondering if why um, and if and how this product would work differently in women or the same and what are you doing in the next trial? So before Stefan should answer that, but um, before that, um, uh, you know, again, I'll go to Tim. What, do you, what is the breakdown in the real world of the patients with refractory ischemia that you get um, according to sex? Yeah, it's a good, if you just take the patients who have um, epicardial coronary disease, then it's more like 75% um, men or 70% men, 30% women. But if you take the microvascular angina population, it's reversed. And I think in particular, we know that um, there's a lot of microvascular disease out there. And uh, you know, if you look at the data that Stefan showed, um, it, it's really mounting that the reducer works really well for microvascular dysfunction. In fact, that may be the way that it helps all the patients, even the ones with epicardial disease, because as we noted, if you post-PCI and post-CTO PCI, 25 to 30% of patients still have angina. So this is probably the microvascular disease, which is probably how it works. 
<laughs> Stefan, you want to comment on this? Sure, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a very good question, but we have to realize that the Cosira 1, of course, I mean, was a small trial. It's 100, it's 100 patients, 104 patients. So half of them did, were not randomized uh, to, uh, to the re device. So you actually end up with about 50 patients. And then if you look at, if you, if you want to do some statistics, then it becomes very difficult to look at differences between male and female. But I think that the Cosira 2 will address that and will address that question. Yeah, I, I will say in Cosira 2, we are enrolling somewhat of a higher proportion of women in the study. So that's a good thing. Okay, other questions? Please come up to the mics. And, and while we're waiting, um, uh, you know, maybe I'll ask um, Alan, uh, you know, St. Francis, one of the higher enrollers uh, in the trial so far, and we're really just getting started, but, but what's been your experience with how easy a procedure this is? What's the learning curve of the procedure? I don't know if you had a lot of access as an interventionalist accessing the coronary sinus. Uh, you know, there can be uh, um, uh, anomalous takeoff of the coronary sinus. Uh, there can be valves in the coronary sinus and trabecula, it can be difficult to pass a guide wire. So what's the learning curve? That's a good question. So I, I wasn't experienced in the coronary sinus until being part of the trial. So obviously for me it was pretty steep. Um, we, ha we had good proctoring. I think we did around 10 cases or so, so far. So I can't say I have the world's experience, but after doing a couple cases, three, four cases, I mean, we're pretty comfortable. I think we're now doing this basically, you know, we have help from the company, but no, you know, no proctor, physician proctor has to come in. And so the learning curve is not, you know, super um, steep or complicated. I think 10, 15 cases and, you know, you ought to be comfortable with it. Stefan, do you want to comment on that? Sure. I mean, um, you know, I started doing uh, the, the re implanting the reducer back in 2010 and I had three cases in my belt when I did the fourth case, which was a life case for TCT. Yeah. <laughs> and luckily everything went well. But uh, over, over the times, you know, I've done about 300 uh, implants and I'm still, you know, the majority goes actually very easy. But here, here and then there is, there is the difficulty that you have to, you know, like you mentioned, valves, uh, difficult takeoff, there is a, there is a bend. Um, and that, that is, that, that is uh, sometimes you have to, uh, you know, have the experience of an of a EP guy who can guide you uh, in, in, uh, in assessing the uh, coronary sinus. Uh, but it's, I, I agree with you, it's, I mean, it's a steep learning curve and, you know, it's, it shouldn't be that difficult. And, and Tim, you have a lot of experience with the device now. What do you think? Yeah, I would agree. I think so. You, there, there are technical nuances that you need to understand. But I think really any um, experienced interventional cardiologist can learn it quickly. And um, if, the elect, if, if the electrophysiologist can get in the coronary sinus, the interventional cardiologist <laughs> can. So, I, you know, I mean, the surface, this is implanting a bare metal stent in a normal vein, okay? Think of, for those of you who do uh, intervention in saphenous vein grafts, I mean, really, that should be all it is, and probably 95% of the time that is what it is, but occasionally it can be hard to find the origin of the coronary sinus or negotiate it. Now, one of the advantages of a valve, though, is uh, um, I think it was... Uh, um, uh, I can't remember Omega or, or Tim that mentioned that it usually takes six, to, I think with Stefan, takes six to eight weeks for the device to endothelialize and create a pressure gradient. But actually at times you will implant it on a valve and that will actually cover the struts and you can have almost immediate relief. And that's probably about 10 or 15% of the cases. So Omega, let me ask you, um, uh, you know, you, you did a beautiful job introducing Cosira 2. Um, we're really working hard on uh, uh, blinding this, as you know, and uh, um, uh, of course the interventionalists are not blinded in the cath lab, but all the patients, their families, and all the healthcare assessors are blinded uh, because a lot of the endpoints are quality of life endpoints, a lot of the endpoints are, you know, exercise duration is the primary endpoint, and how hard you push, how hard the uh, person running the exercise test pushes the patient to exercise can affect how long the patient exercises. And so it's critical that all people be blinded. Uh, so we have a lot of endpoints that we're measuring. Actigraphy, uh, Seattle Angina questionnaire, uh, um, uh, again, modified Bruce exercise duration, CCS Angina class. Um, and then you were, uh, I think, uh, enthused about some of the sub-studies, particularly the PET sub-study to see if we can mechanistically show a, quantitatively a reduction in ischemia. Which of these endpoints as a clinician are kind of most important uh, to you uh, to translate to improved outcomes uh, for patients' quality of life? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So I think this has obviously been a challenging population and you know these patients are the ones that call me often and you know you really feel bad that you just don't have anything to offer them because we're so wired to putting in a stent and they feel better and so it's a frustrating population. Uh, for me, I'm most excited about the idea of being able to hear that a patient is able to walk more. Um, so more than the quality of life scores I am interested in, but I think just being able to walk more, because a lot of these patients aren't able to make any, you know, I'm in New York City, so they're not able to walk their New York City block anymore. Yeah. And so I think, I think the walk duration is what I'm most excited about. So, you know, in that regard, we're doing something still moderately new, which is we're measuring actigraphy, okay? And it's actually a, a wrist monitor that you put on, and it measures, you know, steps and total activity uh, of the patient, and looks at how well they're sleeping and, and other types of parameters. And so it's not artificial the way a, a modified Bruce exercise test is. So, you know, Tim, I think some of the reasons that your patients may get better with just medications is that they decrease the amount of their activity just so they're not having angina. I think it's going to be fascinating to see if in this trial, if we improve modified Bruce exercise tests, if that correlates with them actually doing more in a 24-hour period during their, you know, ADLs. You know, I think it's a really important issue because if you take care of these patients, really what you find out is they tolerate so much chest pain. And so they'll, at their activity, they'll titrate their activity to do it. So when the trials that you've been involved in or treatments you've been involved in, you find that they still might have five episodes of angina per week, but now they're doing twice as much activity. So th this will be great to get insights into that. Well, this has been a great discussion. Uh, Tim, why don't let me turn it over to you and give you some uh, closing remarks, please. So first, as you can uh, hear, we're excited about the trial. So for those of you out here, number one, we're still looking for active, good sites. So if you're interested from that standpoint, if you're interested in how you can develop a angina clinic at your institution, we're happy to help. Second of all, um, if you aren't in a trial but you have a patient, we're happy to find a site that you can enroll. So we're going to do our best to do this trial, enroll the trial in a timely manner. So in summary, refractory angina is an expensive and debilitating condition. These patients are frequently considered no option patients and it's really without, as the population ages and we've decreased mortality from coronary disease, it's clearly growing. Coronary science reducer is a super promising approach to evaluate symptoms and improve quality of life. And really, our international experience is about 4,000 patients. So for us in the United States, COSIR-2 is designed to provide further evidence of both safety and efficacy of the reducer system. So it's a really important trial, I think, for interventional cardiology. So if you have a patient, just like I said, or if you're interested in how to be involved in the trial, we are happy to help and we'll be here now. So these are the sites uh, we'll end with and we're around to answer any more questions if you have it. So thanks everyone. Great, thank you.